<laughs> Outstanding. Uh, apologies for that. So uh, my name is Aaron Soto. I am the uh, Director of Learning at Corelight, and uh, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Zeek Open Source Project uh, in the light of OpenSOC. So I've actually uh, been part of the OpenSOC team for several years. Very excited to kind of talk about how these two projects are going to work together. Uh, today's presentation was actually going to be a joint presentation with Amber, who is our Z community director. Uh, she had some unforeseen circumstances came up, so I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about the community piece, but uh, I'll try and do it justice uh, to, to her, uh, her content. Uh, to kind of uh, talk a little bit about, um, hold on, let me get my, I see, that is going to be, I, I, I do not blame Discord right now. It just had the, the rug pulled out from under it. So let me switch over to this. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Zeek. What is Zeek? Uh, it's an open source framework that is used for, um, really? Okay. Uh, it's an open source framework used for um, uh, network security monitoring, basically uh, looking at network traffic. And you might have heard of Zeek uh, as Bro. So back in, this was back in 95, uh, Bro started uh, at Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. And there were a number of people who were, were looking into this, this problem space and, and were thinking in a, not, not, not even as in a security context, but just looking at network traffic at large. Uh, and the name Bro kind of was, uh, you know, more, uh, it really was a, kind of a, a, a nod to Big Brother being like, this, this has a lot of surveillance potential, but it also has a lot of, uh, network security potential, which is obviously what we'll be focusing on today. But if you've heard of Bro or if you've heard of Zeek, it was probably as part of like a research center, university government, like a big organization having it in a SOC, using it for incident response, for threat hunting, um, even potentially for like uh, network forensics and network operations. There's actually some vendors, though I mentioned I, I, uh, I'm employed by Corelight. There are a number of vendors who actually have uh, Zeek integrated in with their platform and use it. Uh, so if you've heard of it before, that's probably why. Uh, Zeek itself is actually very customizable, very extensible. It's, it's, almost, it's really kind of its own language. Uh, and there's a lot of that you can do with Zeek in, in terms of just having uh, uh, scripts and plugins and protocol analyzers and, and, and kind of these components that work together to analyze your network traffic. So uh, there's a, the Zeek package manager. If you go to packages.zeek.org, you can see all of these packages that, that the community has contributed, but you also, because it's open source, you can write your own. And so there's actually a try.zeek.org uh, environment where you can play around with that. And I'm not going to dive into that too much right now. I just want you to know that it's, it's, it's out there. So what is the data? Like the Zeek data is really where the power is. And I want to talk about uh, what that looks like. So I'm going to use three examples here, three slides or three uh, logs to kind of start that conversation. On the left is the con log. So that is the uh, connection log. If you've ever seen NetFlow and it's got like IP addresses, ports, protocols, timestamps, like all this really high level information, that's basically the con log. Every single connection will appear in the con log. But then there's these other logs that are more protocol specific. So let's say I have HTTP data, like I have uh, you know, H a web browser talking to a web server. Uh, I'm gonna see all of the metadata associated with that connection. So things like, uh, what was the user agent string that was sent? What's the URI that was requested? If you're talking about the client side, from the server side, like what was the mind type that was returned? How many bytes? What was, this, what was the status code? All of those things we see in our HTTP log. Similarly, if we're talking about other protocols, let's say like DNS, I can see uh, the DNS, uh, like the, the client and the server. I can also see the queries and the answers, the responses, which is surprisingly difficult uh, to dig into sometimes. We'll, we'll talk about that more in a second. Uh, now, realistically, uh, there are only a few logs that you're really focused on at a given, you know, in a, in a given uh, environment and a given exercise, and, and, and frankly, even an open source. But there are well, I'm probably pushing four dozen logs in total now in the, in the Zeek open source project. So there's there's a log for pretty much any protocol you could think of, and all that metadata, or that rich metadata from that that protocol is stored in that log uh, for whatever purpose that you might need. I've got a couple links down at the bottom to uh, Corelight has a little PDF cheat sheet. I'll have that link for you in a second too. Uh, and the uh, Zeek open source project has really good detailed documentation about logs and even some things that didn't make the cheat sheet. Uh, but that's actually where I stole these graphics from. Was from the Corelight cheat sheet uh, because it's a little more colorful. Um, so, how do we like to, to really talk about how we use the? Uh, let me start off by kind of comparing it a little bit. So, maybe just things you're unfamiliar with. Maybe you're familiar with things like packet 
captured that we get some from tools like Wireshark and PTP Dump. Or uh, in the middle, we have it, like intrusion detection systems, intrusion prevention systems. So things like uh, Snort and Suricata, things that we'll find uh, as we kind of work our way through, uh, just kind of looking at uh, uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, signature-based detection. And then on the far right, we have NetFlow. We have, uh, 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 you know, those IP addresses, ports, protocols, timestamps, that kind of high-level information. These are three very common tools that you'll see uh, as you uh, as you're kind of getting familiar, you know, as you're probably already familiar with. But let's use those to kind of compare Zeek. Uh, to start off with, Zeek is, is really fundamentally different from uh, something like NetFlow. It's really, well, it's fundamentally different from all of these, but let's start with NetFlow. Uh, so NetFlow is giving us just that, that you know, I mean, there's a protocol timestamp, just that, that generic info uh, versus uh, the uh, uh, something like Zeek is going to be able to understand protocols at a much deeper level. So it understands how something like uh, HTTP works and it can pull out all that metadata. It can even see things like files being sent over HTTP and extract those files out. So we, we're not saving everything, we're saving the most useful tidbits. Uh, and, and really, when you're thinking of Zeek, I want to, you know, I talk about how it compares to some of these tools. But I want to say, like, throw away your IDS, throw away NetFlow. Folks should be useful and deploy Zeek in parallel with these tools. And, and especially if you have something like uh, full packet capture, then you can go ahead and use uh, Zeek to help find where the, the, the most interesting pieces of that full packet capture, that, that, that data reside. Uh, now, Comparing Zeek to an IDS is, is something that's very commonly done, and I want to take just a second to talk to that because Zeek isn't here to say what's good or bad or what's right or wrong. It's here to say this is what's happening in the network. This team is going to be something that's going to be happening. So I'm going to sound smaller because I need to respond to that, or at least I need to investigate it to look at it. Um, but uh, Zeek is just here logging everything that's going on and giving us the control to say, is this good or is this bad? Um, now, as I mentioned before, Zeek is very expandable, very extensible, uh, and so there's a lot of things that we can add on to Zeek. We can kind of do things like, hey, if you see these kinds of anomalies, let me know. If you, Because Zeek understands protocols at such a low level, it can do things like say, hey, this looks like protocol abuse. This looks like a situation because I totally understand how this protocol should work, and this is not conforming to that standard. I'm going to go ahead and write uh, a notice log. I'm going to go ahead and write something to the weird log. And we'll talk about some of those logs a little bit more in a second. Uh, but there's a lot of things that we can do with this. So when I'm talking about Zeek data, what I'm really talking about is the, the, the uh, representation of network traffic, of what you're seeing uh, on your network as it's, uh, as it's represented in Zeek data. Now, uh, there's a couple of ways you can get those logs out. You can look at, at, at the raw Zeek logs, and we'll kind of see a little bit of that uh, uh, today. Uh, but as you you normally use in an enterprise and as you'll use an open sock, that data is being forwarded to a seam where you can uh, interact with that and, and get, you get the context of all the other host-based data and everything else that's coming into that seam environment. So. Uh, in case you haven't guessed already, our seam of choice for OpenSock, uh, if you were watching the workshop earlier, is Graylog. And so we'll talk about what this looks like in Graylog. Uh, but one of the things that, that is, uh, before we jump into that, I want to talk about uh, how we kind of associate these logs with each other. So remember I said we had like a con log and an HTTP log. Uh, and so every connection that comes in, I'll see in my con log. But every time uh, there's some HTTP data, uh, HTTP application uh, uh, layer protocol identified in this connection, uh, there will be an HTTP log for that connection that has all that relevant metadata. Now, the question becomes, how do I kind of pivot? How do I jump as I'm, you know, I see something in my con log and I know there's HTTP in there. How do I go find the matching thing uh, in my HTTP log? So the way you're going to do that is with what's called the, the UID or the connection unique ID. And that's something that every time there's a mention of this connection, it's going to appear in any one of these logs. So if I have a connection, let's say, uh, that, that, that uses HTTP and let's say it transfers a file. 
Well, then I'm going to see that same UID in my con log, in my HTTP log, and in my files log. And each one of those logs is going to give me the information about that, that file transfer. On the topic of file transfers, there's another type of unique ID called the file unique ID. And similarly, if I kind of want to pivot around and investigate a file that's uh, that's happening or that, that, that I'm you know interested in, um, then I can use that file unique ID and search through logs and see what connections are associated with that uh, unique ID. So, all right, I've done a lot of vague explanation. I want to dive into like one pretty thorough use case. And I want to do this for two reasons. One, I want to get you in the mindset of, of, of how an incident responder thinks. And for some of us, that's not a stretch. And for some of us, that might be a little new. Uh, but the second thing I want to do is I want to show you how you would use just Zeek data to work through a particular incident. And so let's say I'm, you know, fresh out of college or fresh, uh, uh, you know, out of another career field. I'm pivoting, uh, and I'm, and I'm, you know, just joined this team. Uh, I, I'm a SOC analyst. I'm entry level, uh, and as is, you know, tradition, uh, I am awarded the honor of the night shift. And I'm sitting here and I'm watching alerts roll in, um, and it's my job to kind of triage these alerts. So I'm trying to figure out uh, when something comes in. Do I have uh, like a playbook or procedure, something that I can fall back to, to say, I know how to handle this. We've seen this before, or I have something in my playbook uh, that I know how to, how to resolve this myself. Uh, is it maybe uh, instead something that I can, I can dismiss? I can say, well, this is a false positive, or this is not actionable. Okay, somebody's port scanning doesn't matter, I can't really do anything about it. Uh, or in you know the, the third case, do I need to escalate this? Do I need to bring this to some other senior member of my team who can then uh, you know spend a little bit more time looking at this or maybe has the expertise uh, to work through this? And so uh, it's 2 a.m. I'm sitting here, I'm watching these alerts roll and I'm trying to figure out, can I deal with this? Can I, you know, can I deal with this myself? Can I dismiss this? Do I need to escalate this? And uh, alert, an alert comes in from our intrusion detection system, and it says, hey, I saw a DNS request leaving the network, and the host name in that DNS request matched a signature, so the IDS raised an alert to say, I know that, I, I have a signature that says that's associated with a known command and control server, a C2 server. So what am I going to do? Can I, can I deal with this myself? Do I, can I dismiss this? Do I need to escalate this? And if I just have Zeek data uh, to look at this, uh, I might start off in my DNS log. So I mentioned there's a, a log for DNS, and this is a DNS-related alert. Let me turn to my DNS log, and I'm going to see uh, the workstation or stations, potentially, that are, have tried to reach out and look up that host name. The DNS servers that responded to that, which maybe is something internal, maybe it's you know an external DNS server, depending on how if I can you know block that from leaving my network. I see the the query itself, which in theory my IDS already told me, so it's not really that big of a deal. Uh, but the big one here is the answer field, and it's literally called answer. There's a field in your DNS log, and it is the response that was provided to the client. So in this case. I know the client queried for this uh, this host name. I want to know what IP address they got back. A lot of times, even with good DNS logging, you know, setup, if you have your DNS server set up to, to forward logs, a lot of times they won't give you that last piece. They won't give you the answer, the IP address, and I need that because I need to pivot from my DNS log to my con log. I the, the question that I'm asking myself right now is, okay, I know that there was a DNS request leaving the network, but was there a connection that followed that to the IP address that was resolved? Uh, maybe uh, the, the, I had like an intrusion prevention system that stopped it. Maybe I got lucky and the attacker's infrastructure was down and I just you know dodged that bullet. Uh, but I want to know if there was a connection, I want to know more about it. And let's say for the sake of this example, there was. There was a connection. Uh, and so I, I can pivot from my DNS log to my con log, look for connections to that IP address, say uh, that there were connections. I want to see what ports they're on. When did they happen? Are they still happening? How many bytes were sent uh, either way? And ports in particular is interesting because I want to know a little bit more about this, this communication. Let's say for the sake of this example that uh, the, the communication to that server was on port 80. Well, the more veterans of you might say port 80 is obviously HTTP. I know that. But hang on. Put your attacker hat on for a second and think about this. An attacker doesn't have to use the port that for its intended purpose. So just because they're on port 80 doesn't mean they're using HTTP. 
But one of the cool things Zeek does is it has what's called dynamic protocol detection, DPD. So I'll see in my con log a field called service that tells me uh, the protocols identified. Zeek knows, regardless of what port it's on, what's going on inside that connection. And so it'll say, yep, I know there's HTTP inside of here. I don't care that it's on port 80. I mean, obviously that's that would go what what that'd be what we would expect. But Zeek tells me certainly this is has HTTP traffic. So I'm gonna pivot now from my con log to my HTTP log to get more information. Uh, and how do I pivot between those two logs? the connection unique identifier, that UID field. Remember that appears in every single log uh, that has information about this connection. So I'm gonna look to that UID field uh, and look to see uh, if I have, well, I'll have a matching entry in my HTTP log. And in there, I'm gonna see things that uh, relate to this connection, things like user agent strings and cookie values, get post parameters, things that the uh, browser sent as part of that request. And also I get some response information. And these are things that, uh, you'll hear the term uh, an indicator or an IOC uh, that stands for an indicator of compromise. These are things that might help us figure out exactly what this is, what malware strain we're dealing with. And that's something that, again, I might be able to go back to previous incidents and playbooks and community resources and say, hey, what is this thing? Does anybody, does anybody recognize this string that looks a little bit weird? Do I know what malware that's associ associated with? Um, and so if, if so, I might be able to handle this myself. I might say, all right, cool. Uh, this is an incident that I know how to resolve. I'm going to go ahead and quarantine, you know, kick that machine off the network. Uh, I'll contact the user. We'll start an IT ticket, get it re-imaged, and um, probably reset the user's password. Uh, but okay, I can handle it, right? Uh, but I like being the worst case scenario person. What happens if I don't know how to deal with this? What happens if, if, I'm, if I don't have uh, any indicators that I can pull up and say, I know what malware strain this is? Let's say for the sake of this example, that this is a downloader. This is a piece of malware that kind of uh, establishes, you know, a foothold on this compromised workstation and then beacons out to a C2 server and starts downloading additional malware. And it's gonna bring back, uh, tools, things that might potentially uh, let the attacker kind of expand their foothold on this on this workstation or within this network. So in that case, I would see all these HTTP connections and I would see uh, mentions in my files log. So I could pivot from the HTTP log to the files log using that connection ID again and say, hey, what files are being transferred here? Specifically, I'm looking for, uh, so Zeek has the ability to extract MD5, SHA-1, and SHA-256 checksum. And so these checksums are things that, again, can be an indicator of compromise, another IOC that I can use and go back and say, what is this? What, you know, maybe I don't know what the downloader is, but I can kind of know what these other tools are, and I can start to understand what the capabilities of this are. I can also look around my network and see what other machines have seen those, those hashes. And, and maybe there's other machines that are part of this uh, compromise that I'm just now discovering now. Um, but... Uh, Let's let's say, I don't know, I like being the worst case scenario person. Let's say that uh, the attacker gets a foothold on that machine and starts deleting evidence, which, you know, putting my open sock hat on for a second, it's been known to happen. So let's say the attacker goes in and starts to clean up after themselves. And I'm like, well, great. All, all the information on that endpoint now that the evidence is getting erased. Well, remember I talked about Zeke having file extraction. So I can pull out those files as they go across the wire, save them to disk, and even if they get deleted, you know, zero-wise, wiped, whatever, off that workstation, I still have those binaries. So putting my worst case scenario hat on again, if I say, all right, well, the evidence has gone over there, I still have these binaries that I can go back to and figure out exactly what they're capable of. If I have to escalate this and, you know, it's 2.15 in the morning now and I have to call one of the senior members of my team to say, yo, um, this looks bad. Uh, you know, I'm pretty sure this is an actual incident. Uh, here are the things that I know so far. I know the IP address that we're beginning out to. I can tell you all the hosts that are talking to that host name or that IP address. Uh, I have some indicators that we can potentially write some IDS signatures for so we can catch this in the future. I have these SHA-1, uh, MB5, and SHA-256 hashes that I, we can, you know, search the network and I can tell you what machines have this, this uh, malware associated with them. So I figured out in the scope and I mean both in time and in the host associated with this. And if we have to bring in, you know, uh, reverse engineers or, uh, you know, malware analysis people, they have those binaries they can start tearing through. So even in the worst case scenario, I've got a lot of evidence here, even, even without talking about anything on the endpoint at all.
So I know I'm, I'm, I belabor this uh, quite a bit, but I think it's it's powerful to talk through kind of the questions that you'll be asking yourself as you're going through something like an open sock exercise or a real world exercise. They're shockingly similar. Uh, and also to understand where you go in the Zeek data to, add, to uh, get, uh, understand those questions a little bit better. So there's, there's many ways, as I mentioned, that, that the Zeek data can be represented. So here I have a screenshot of Splunk, which is, you know, you can get a free version and pump, pipe the data into Splunk and go, sure, that's a thing, um, you know, if, if you're a Splunk person. Um, we had a talk earlier on Kavram. We started a little fast differently. If you're using the, the Elastic, uh, the Elk stack, you can feed uh, this data into Kibana and look at it uh, that way as well. Uh, but our tool of choice in OpenSock is going to be Graylog. And so you should get comfortable with what this looks like uh, in Greylog. So to start off with, um, when you get access to the OpenSock environment and you go to Greylog, you might look at you end up uh, end up looking at a screen like this. That should, uh, you know, when you click on the streams, you're just going to get the stream of data. This is everything that's going across the network right now. It's a ton of data, right? Um, and so as you're looking through this, I want to talk through a little bit about the Greylog interface, but also we'll we'll use it to kind of talk about what the the Zeek data will look like. So to start off with, you'll notice that I've uh, typed a query into uh, my Greylog window here that I am looking for for Zeek data. Specifically, I am uh, uh, asking Greylog to search for a field called event type, and I want you to tell me when that event type equals Zeek. And so this is going to limit down uh, the, uh, the uh, events that are returned back to me uh, as part of this, uh, this UI. And so the other, this is the gotcha that you'll find again and again, um, uh, especially in open software, like you'll be looking for an artifact and like, I can't find it, it's not here, I don't know where it is. It's because you probably have your search set to like the last five minutes. And if you're looking for something that happened several hours ago, well, yeah, you're not going to see it. So I'm also going to go ahead and turn down or turn up, I guess you could say, uh, my, my search window to a larger window. Maybe I have a particular time span and I can input that, but, but right now I'm just kind of taking a, a casual stroll through the data. Uh, so with those things, I'm going to scroll down a little bit. And on the right-hand side here, you see the, the Greylog uh, events. And so these are Zeek events specifically, and you'll notice there's a lot of them, um, but uh, each one of these is is a, a Zeek log, a, a line in a Zeek log that's giving me some information about communication that happened. And if I click on any given one of them, you'll notice the event type is Zeek. That's why this was returned. And there's a lot of information here inside uh, this particular log entry. The first thing that you should look at, the first thing I want you to get familiar with is this file uh, field. And so the file field tells me which type of log is this. In this particular case, I'm looking at a MySQL log or MySQL log. So this is going to have information about a database transaction uh, that occurred here. Now, if you look down a little bit further, you will see the message, which is the line. Uh, this is the, these are the individual fields of the MySQL log. Now, there's one thing I'm going to come completely clean here. Uh, and, uh, and some of the logs that you'll see, they don't really parse that cleanly. And so for something like this, I have to kind of turn back to some of those cheat sheets or that documentation to figure out like, what does each field mean? Like I can see the first field of timestamp and the second field that starts with a C, that's my connection unique ID. So that's that's something I could pivot off of. I see some IP addresses, some ports, I see a MySQL query. Some of it's a little self-explanatory, uh, but, but refer to that documentation as needed. Let me give you another example here. So I'm scrolling down looking at another entry. Uh, again, event type is Zeek. That will be consistent. But instead now I'm looking at the con log. So this is that connection log. This is giving me information about a connection that occurred. Uh, and I see the message down here that those fields, which you'll also notice, all the fields have been broken out for me. So I can see the connection state, the destination IP. There's a boolean that tells me is that inside my network. Um, and that's a, that's a Zeek variable that gets set. Uh, I get to see you know the destination port. The history field uh, is actually a really interesting one. I don't have nearly enough time to dive into it, but it's really well documented. And it tells you uh, kind of the order of things that happened inside the communication. Uh, so there's a lot of things here. And also you'll notice, uh, I, I could scroll down, but I can also see it here in the message field, that connection unique ID. So sure, there's a connection here. All right, it's on port 80. Is it HTTP? Well, I see HTTP in my message there. And if I were to scroll down, I would see that as part of my service field. But I can look uh, and search, write a, a gray log query to search for that connection unique ID and find all the information associated with this particular connection. 
So as we scroll down a little bit further, uh, oh, look, here's an HTTP log entry. And so uh, this file here tells me I'm looking at the HTTP log. I get a little information from the client side. So it looks like this is a get request for the, the slash you know, kind of the root page. Uh, so I can see a little bit of information from the client. I can see a little bit of information from the server. So the server, if I just run it back to the 200, okay, which is perfectly normal, right? Um, at least that's what I would generally expect. And so all these fields, again, are broken out for me uh, as I work my way through. One more log entry I want to talk about uh, is the files log. So I mentioned that whenever uh, we see a file transfer, the example I used was HTTP, but it actually works over SMB, uh, SMTP, HTTP, FTP. Uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting many of them, but fundamentally, if we can see a file transfer that's happening, we can pull that off the wire. And so you'll see an entry in your files log that gives you uh, uh, things like the MIME type. So, oh, this looks like it was an, uh, an MP4 video. I get those hashes, those checksum values, which in the case of a video, maybe that's interesting or not. You can look like a Word document. That might be a lot more interesting. That might be something that would be a very interesting uh, indicator to key off of. Um, in some cases, you'll see the file name. In this particular case, this was part of an HTTP connection that it just wasn't provided in a header. We just couldn't extract it for one reason or another. Uh, but if we do get the opportunity to pull a file name off the wire, we'll happily do that. Yeah. Um, there's one thing that I, I didn't have an arrow to on this slide, and that, as you'll notice, just under the file name is the file unique ID. And so similar to the connection unique ID that starts with a C, the file unique ID starts with an F. And that tells me that this is associated with a, a file transfer. So there's a lot of data. I'm just giving you the highlights, and I promise you're going to see some of those in some open sock scenarios later. Not that, you know. I don't, don't want to spoil too much. Um, I'll put these URLs in the uh, Discord chat as well. I'll also post a, uh, a, a PDF of these slides so you'll have these. Uh, but these are the two resources I would suggest to get comfortable with Zeek data. So the thing on the left is the PDF. I like it because it's searchable. The thing on the right is the Zeek documentation from Read the Docs uh, that does a, a much better job of going into more depth and has more logs that didn't re really make the cut on the cheat sheet. So I only have a few minutes left, and I want to talk very briefly about the Zeek community. Uh, in, in, by all rights, this would be Amber here talking about, uh, as a community director, she, she would talk authoritatively about this, and there's so much that's going on now and, and uh, on, on the roadmap. But uh, fundamentally, the things that you should know about is head to zeek.org slash connect. So zeek.org is the Zeek website. They've got a YouTube channel. They've got a, a Twitter account that's constantly posting and retweeting uh, new packages and things that are relevant to uh, current uh, you know, vulnerabilities and, uh, that are being you know, uh, blowing up Twitter. Uh, Zeke started a Slack uh, organization, a Slack channel, which uh, Discord, uh, I'm working on it, but uh, Slack is, is the, the home of a lot of these really great conversations that you can have alongside the Zeke developers, the package developers, and they're a really approachable community. Uh, that said, because it is such a, it has such a long history to it, there are also some very good mailing lists uh, that you should join as well. Uh, on the bottom left, you see uh, there are a lot of in-person events, obviously not happening at the moment, but keep an eye out if you hear uh, Zeke Hour, Zeke Days. Uh, these are uh, kind of local uh, uh, organizations, so you can kind of come and, and hang out for a happy hour and, and, and meet people. Uh, in fact, you can you can kind of help Amber organize your own if this is something that you want to bring to your area. Uh, I'll give you your, her contact information. She'll be eager to, to talk to you. Uh, Zeke Week is actually an annual event that we do, so it's it's all these these conversations about Zeke package development, things from like how are how how are, how are uh, you know blue teamers using this to defend themselves, all the way down to like the lowest uh, internals of uh, of the the Zeke uh, ecosystem. Um, there are also now a lot of virtual events that are happening. So uh, if you check out the, the Zeke.org site or the Zeke Slack, you'll hear about a lot of online events that are happening. Things that are uh, uh, there's. Zeke from home, uh, there's uh, Ask the Zeke Experts, which is where they bring in a lot of uh, experts and you can just be like, hey, I'm trying to install Zeke at home and I'm hitting this error and they'll happily walk you through it. Uh, super, super approachable community. Um, and, and to that end, I would encourage you to contribute to that community. So a lot of folks, especially approaching open source, think, well, hey, I'm getting started or hey, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on this blue team thing and I'm figuring this out, but like, I don't know anything about development or, uh, you know, uh, well, anything <laughs> about, you know, what seems like it would be needed here. And I want to dispel that because there's so much, uh, uh, so many skills that are required to make this work. So yes, you might be thinking in code. You might be saying, well, I, you know, I'm not a good coder. 
well, okay, what about uh, looking into the user community and contributing to uh, as you're as you're installing this and you're saying, hey, this documentation you know is, is a little bit unclear or hey, I tried to do this and this documentation didn't work for me. Let me fire off something on the mailing list and 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 say, hey, I have some suggestions. Uh, how do I you know uh, make some proposals to the the documentation? Maybe you want to try your hand at scripting. Scripting is actually pretty approachable and there's so much that you can do in the Zeek language. Uh, things that are just very simple that, that, that are going to help you in your day-to-day -day versus like, hey, there's a protocol I just want to tear into, um, whatever that might be. Uh, maybe you're just saying, hey, I, you know, I don't know anything about Zeek yet. Where could I start? Download it, get the, get some of the latest releases and, and give us an okay and say, yep, we tested it out, it worked. Help us uh, test releases and, and get that feedback. So there's so much that you can do and, and it's so tempting to think of this as like, I'm at the bottom of this ladder and I and I don't have the skills that I need to climb it. And Amber uh, has this awesome metaphor about, think of this as a lattice. Think about kind of moving diagonally. Think about kind of charting your own path and building your own skill set as you're, as you're contributing back to the community. This goes for so many communities, but I think for Zeek, uh, it's especially true. So uh, there are a couple links that I threw down uh, earlier, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, link to the Zeek documentation. So if you're interested in deploying Zeek locally, probably something I would recommend putting off till after OpenStock because you're going to have a busy weekend. But uh, you've got the link there. Again, I'll post these in the Discord. Security Onion, a lot of you know uh, as, as kind of the Kali for Blue Team. It's, it's a Linux distribution that has all of these tools built into them, including Zeek. And so if you're interested in just having kind of a live environment, I, I wouldn't recommend it for like, you know, a, a, a full production environment, but for just getting your your your, your feet wet and understanding uh, how this works together with these other tools, Security Onion is a fantastic starting point. Uh, I mentioned the, the the that PDF, so I've got the link to the PDF there. And oh, by the way, there's this event that's happening called OpenSoc. Uh, if you haven't joined the OpenSoc or the OpenSoc Discord yet, there's a lot that's happening there. It starts tomorrow, but you can you can swing on by. You can get uh, registered and set up. Check out the DC28 OpenSoc CTF in the Blue Team Village. Discord uh, for more information about that. Um, so with that said, I think I am pretty darn close to time here. I want to leave you with my contact info, uh, Aaron Soto at Corelight.com. Amber is our uh, Zeek Community Director, um, an, an incredible resource and just uh, just constantly has these amazing plans for uh, the Zeek community and, 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 and helping it grow. Um, so uh, if you are interested at all, there's also a, a Zekurity Twitter account that I mentioned. There's a Zeek channel in that OpenSock Discord. So if you're not going to play, even if you're not going to play OpenSock, come join the Zeek channel um, and, and uh, start uh, kind of have the conversation there. Keep an eye out for a lot of these online events. As I mentioned, Zeek from home, ask the Zeek experts. There's a lot more on the way that I'm sure Amber could rattle off. Uh, and we're also doing not quite as cool as OpenSock, I'll admit, uh, but some community CTFs to help you learn uh, the, the Zeek environment. Um, so with that said, I know I am pretty darn close to time. Um, did we have any questions from the uh, from the chat? Um, I'm going to scroll and kind of take a quick look here, but uh, if you have any, um, I'm actually happy to have a conversation with folks afterwards, um, as I know we are pretty darn close. Uh, I'm hearing people ask about, you know, how hard is it to set up? I encourage you if you, if you, uh, sorry.